Maybe some of it's being used. How do we want to go ahead and allocate those chunks of memory? Now we could say, all right, this is fixed. Every chunk of memory is exactly 4K long. Now, if you only need 1K, sorry, you're going to get 4K, just because it makes it easy on me, the program, the operating system. But it's not very efficient, right? Or you can have dynamic partitioning, and hey, if you only need 1K, I'm just going to give you 1K. But if you need 7K, I'm going to give you 7K. Now, all of a sudden, you have to do a lot more programming. You have to have bigger data structures in order to handle the, oh, well, this one was one, and this one was seven, and this one was two, and if I want to pull out the seven, do I have enough room for an eight? It gets more complex. All right. Uh, so the decision making is a lot tougher. So again, here's an example of the fixed partitioning. Notice each one here is exactly eight meg. Over here, well, the first one's eight, that one's two, the next one's four, that one's six. So here's our dynamic unequal size partitions, and here's our fixed size partitions. Uh, now, we've talked about fragmentation, and fragmentation occurs with what? Part though is I have a fixed chunk of memory, right? I have 8K, and you only need 1K of it. We've got we sort of wasted those seven of those K, right? Okay, and so within that chunk, we've got some freed up area. Uh, and again, you can either have internal fragmentation or external fragmentation. We'll get into that a little bit later. By the way, today is Fat uh, Tuesday. You know, last bit of Mardi Gras, and I've noticed that. There are like two or three or four people that answer all the questions. So to encourage everybody to answer questions today, if you answer a question, you get beads. All right. So dynamic partitioning, again, partitions get created at uh, runtime for a specific process. They're all going to be variable. Um, potentially, your part uh, partitions are going to be contiguous, but you can end up having external fragmentation, which is a bad thing. So let's look at an example of that. Here, in, uh, at the beginning, we have all the memory available. We put in process one, then we put in process two, then we put in process three. We started to you know, generate or started to fill up all our memory. Uh, eventually, process two stops. And now that freed up this chunk in the middle, okay? So we go to process four, and process four is small. It'll fit in that area. But, and then at this point, process A goes away, process one goes away, and now we put in process two. But now we have a little bit of chunk of memory here, a little bit of chunk of memory here, and if something comes in that needs you know, a decent amount of memory, we might have that memory free, but it's not contiguous. We can't put it into any one of those because they're all too small, fragmentation. So when you have it fragmented like that, what's one of the things that you can do to uh, fix the problem? If you have fragmentation, what fixes it? I would make a limiting register to remember where each part of the problem is. Well, I can say, aha, this one starts here, and that one starts there, and this one starts here, and that one starts there. Does that fix the fact that there's a little bit here, and a little bit here, and it's not all together? We can virtualize it, but really what we need is I need a contiguous, at this point, I need a contiguous chunk of memory that's this big. I've got enough, but it's all split out all over the place. How can I get a contiguous chunk that's this big? Defragmentation. Defragmentation. I have to move everything, but I can do it. So we can go ahead and move process four up, just under two, we can move process seven, just under four, and now we have all that free memory at the bottom, we can pull our big process in. Okay, so we can do that uh, defrag or defragmentation, but it's very expensive. If instead we sort of knew, well, I've got this process coming in and I put it here, and this one comes in and I put it in there, it's like a Tetris thing. 
okay, so I'm gonna put this one up here and this one down here and that one goes away and now I can put this one in here. If you knew exactly when it was coming down, you know, falling through this, you know, the, the Tetris thing, I can go ahead and move things, right? So, one thing is, if I've got processes in memory and another one comes in, and I've got two or three places to put it, where should I put it? What is one way, and again, let's say we've got this much memory, and this is taken over by the operating system, I've got process A here, and I've got B here, and I've got C down here, and uh, you know, this one's maybe 10K, and this one's 15K. If I've got a process that comes in D, and maybe it's 5K, where should I put it? Better back, we're gonna make this a little bit better. I'm gonna put this C here, and say this is ten, space of 10, this has a space of 15, and this has a space of five. So what's one algorithm to say, where should I put these? Should I put it here, here, or down here? Like just at the next available slide. Sure, we can do next available. That's one way of doing it. Now, this advantage of that is potentially that's going to increase fragmentation because if I put that in here, um, then now I've got a little bitty five, a little bitty five to fifteen, right? What's another algorithm we could use? The smallest possible. The best fit, right? I'm looking down. I didn't see who was that one. Who said that? All right. Um, so what's another possible one? I mean, we could say, okay, five goes down here. If we put it there, there's absolutely no fragmentation at all, right? We could put it here, the next best, I mean, the, uh, the next one. Um, and that just makes it easy to program. Any other thoughts? Could you just like move B and B also and just put them right under it, so it's like A, B, C, B? Yeah, we could do that. That's fragmentation, defragmentation, and that's really expensive. We're going to move all of this and all of this and all of that. Um, one of the things is, if we do the first fit, okay, and so we put it here, and then A goes away, and we do first fit, it's gonna go up here, right? And then let's say, you know, process D goes away, and we're gonna put it right here, and we're gonna put it right here. If you always put first fit, what happens to this memory here? I mean, it's always being used. We never use this down here. So you can see where that might, cause thrashing up here, or fragmentation up here, and we're never using the stuff at the bottom. So first bit isn't necessarily the best one. What's one way we can keep it from thrashing up here? Can you do like putting it where the most amount of memory is available? Because okay. the most amount will change. Okay, yeah, so we had best bit. Now we're just having the biggest so we're going to take the biggest chunk and cut it. Um, so somebody who has an answer, who doesn't have beads, what's another thought? Instead of always putting it at the first one that fits, going backwards. So what's uh, another thought? Oh, a wrong answer is still an answer. Could you do it like a... Uh... You've answered. <laughs> somebody else. So instead of saying, I'm going to take the first available, why don't I put the next available? So that way, I'm going to put it here the first time, and the next time I'm going to put it here, and the next time I'm going to put it here, and then the next time we'll put it up here. So that way you're not always thrashing at the first, you're going to sort of equally distribute throughout, okay, the whole process space. So in any case, so there's lots of different algorithms out there, and here that's going to minimize uh, external fragmentation. All right, but um, let's pick up. so there's lots of different placement algorithms. And again, if we had an example like this, first fit's going to go to the top, best fit might go to the middle. If we were looking for um, uh, something that's a size, and then the uh, next fit is just going to if the pointer was the current one was here, next fit would be down here. Questions on that?
Okay, well, that's okay as far as it goes, but it sort of assumes that there's another one, it's called the buddy system. And basically, it's sort of a combination between fixed and dynamic. Okay. And basically what it does is it says, hey, um, we've got one block of memory. And then when a process comes in and it needs X amount of memory, we look and say, hey, will it fit here? Yes? Great. I'm going to go ahead and split this into two halves. So let's say we had 1K of memory. So I'm going to split this into 512 and 512. And I'm going to put my process up here. Okay. And then the next time something comes in, it's basically going to say, okay, well, how big is it? Well, let's say I need a 510, and this maybe this was 10K. If I need uh, 510K, can I fit it in this half? No, because you know there's 512, we took 10 of it, there's only 502 left. So I gotta put it down here, right? So I put my 500 uh, and 10K right here. And so I've got two, can I put it up here? Yeah, but I'm gonna go ahead and split this into you know, 64 and 64. So I go ahead and put the process here. So basically what you end up with is, and then we said, okay, um, is the 128 yeah, big enough for the 512? Yeah, we can fit it in there. Can we fit it in half of it? So we actually split it into five, uh, 256 and 256. Okay, well, fit the 256, yes. Can we split that in half? And so go ahead and split it into you know, 128, 128. And then it says, okay, well, that's the size we needed because we needed 100. We can't split 128 into 6464 because that wouldn't be big enough for the 100 we need. So we're going to allocate 100 of the 128. And then everything else is open and available. So then when we get a request for 240, well, it won't fit in the 128 that's free, but it will fit in the 256K block. Okay? If we split it in half, <coughs> Uh, the 256 and the 128, 128, that's not big enough for 240, so we're going to leave it at the 512. Well, then we get a request for 64. So we go down here, can we do the 128? Yep. We can split it in half. 64 actually fills that region, and then we have our other 64. So then we go down here, and process B releases, so we can set 256 back. Eventually A releases, so we get the 128 back, but that block is still split because of C. Um, let's say another one for 75 comes in, so we can use that 128. Uh, C goes away, E goes away. All of a sudden now, as soon as E is gone, we can now reclaim that 512. So we can put it back together. So we can put big things in it again. Um, and again, if 256 comes, we'll split the 512, put the 256. Eventually, when it goes away, we re-merge the whole one back. Right. So basically, if you're splitting things in half, and having, well, this section and this section, and then this section gets split in half, this section and this section. What data structure does that sound like? Oh, it's, it's like All right, so yeah, what we're looking at is a binary tree. So you originally start off with one meg, you split it into two uh, 512s, eventually you split that to two 512s and 256 and 128 and 64. As things get freed up, you kill the leaf nodes, you pop back to the uh, parent node, and each parent node goes, hey, this is what I have to do. So fairly easy to implement a binary tree. Now we've got an easy way to, to have semi-dynamic uh, partitions. Now again, you can't just say, oh, in the previous example, if we were completely um, uh, segmented, so it was actually dynamic, then we would just go ahead and request do a 100 and a 240 and a 64 and exactly 75. But then we have a lot more uh, overhead for that data structure of, oh, this one's exactly 65 and then I pull it and put it back, yes? Processes that like grow in size maybe like a recursive? And that's another problem, but we'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> um, but assuming a process knew exactly how much 
its max is, is going to make, that it's going to take, then you can do something like this. And the completely um, dynamic will take a lot more work. This partially and the completely partition, fixed partition, isn't, it's going to have a lot more um, fragmentation. So this is a halfway between the two. You have fixed partitions, they're always going to be multiples of two, you know, 5, 12, 128, 64, but um, you can at least get closer to the size you need than just the, okay, you know, your 8K blocks, period, even if you only have the 64 that you need. And it's a really easy data structure to define a tree. Okay, <clears throat> so now we can start partitioning these things as we go, or maybe up there. Now, what if we really, really want a gig of memory, but we only have, you know, 512K? Can we implement a gig of memory if we only have 512 physical? Yes, through virtualization. Yay! So we end up, we end up dividing memory into chunks, okay? And at any point, if you don't have enough physical memory, then you're going to take one chunk out, put it back in the disk potentially, go to the disk and get in the chunk that you need. Those chunks are called pages, and we're only going to keep the relevant pages in memory at any one time. Okay, so who does that? Well, a lot of times, you know, you've got the CPU up here, and you may have what's called an MMU, a memory management unit. Because you don't want the CPU spinning cycles taking care of memory. So you have another CPU or another chip that's doing all the memory management, the page tables, the lookup tables, the swapping in and out, all that kind of stuff. CPU is just fat, dumb, and happy up there going, hey, okay, I need this address. And it doesn't care whether it's actually in physical memory or it's in virtual memory. It doesn't have to go up to the disk. It just says, hey, MMU, I need this. And MMU says, okay, now I'll do all the work to actually go out and get it and come back. Now, for a while, they were actually separate chips. Pretty much now, it's just built in together. When you have that one big chip, it's going to have the CPU and the MMU and maybe even the GPU, graphics processing unit, all in the same thing. Okay, so everybody's taking hardware course, right? And been through the whole painting thing where we're going to you know, have, let's say, eight or uh, what is this? This one's 4K chunks of memory. So every 4K chunk is over here. So we have a virtual address, you know, 101010. And we go ahead and say, oh, this part of the address is actually going to go into our page table. And when they say 101, we think virtually we're at 101, but when we actually go to the table, we look up 101, and 101 is actually 1111. So we actually go out to that area of memory, we pull things in, and everything's cool. So, so here's our physical memory down here. Here's our virtual memory up here. <clears throat> now, some of this stuff may not be in, mem in memory at all. So we'll actually have X's there. So if we have this chunk of memory is there, but it's actually down at entry number seven. And this chunk of memory is not in memory at all. It's on disk. This one is here, but it's at five. This one's at four. This one's at one, and this one's at two. So they're not even necessarily in the same order, but that's okay. When you ask for an address, it goes to the table, looks it up, and it says, okay, now I'm gonna go over there. And basically, it's done by altering the address. So, as y'all remember from hardware course, you're going to take these four bits here, okay? So, 0010. 0010 is what in decimal? 0010. Yeah. Anybody else want to answer that one? All right. 0010. One's place, two's place, four's place, eight place. So it's a what? Two. Two. I don't know who answered that one, so I'll just fling it out someplace. Oh, I'm supposed to catch it. Somebody catch? All right. Everybody answered that. Okay, so we're going to take two. We're going to go up here to the two and go, oh, well, two is actually located at 110. 
So I'm going to replace this 0010 with 110. We'll take this offset part here, stick it up here. We're going to take our 110 and stick it up here in place of the one, our 0010. And now we have our new physical address. So the virtual address was 8196, or this long string. Our actual physical address is going to be the 25, uh, 2458. All you have to do is you have that table, you just mask off this part, pull this up, add the other part on, now you have your new address. Anybody not remember this from hard work? Okay, well that's great. I mean, we could just have in our page table um, the address coming in and the address coming out. But we probably need a little bit more in that data structure to make it really effective. So things like, well, actually I'll go ahead and ask the question. If we have pages in memory, right? And at some point we're going to swap this page out and put another one in its place. What is one thing we might want to know about this page to know whether we should take it out or not? Sorry, what? Is this like where it is? Um, that probably doesn't matter because the page table is going to take care of that, right? So what? Why would this one be a better one to take out than that one? Size. Hmm. The size. Size might be okay, except all the pages are all the same size. You already got one. You already got one. Right. So if they actually used it, um, then hey, maybe we don't need this again, right? What would be another thing? Let's say it's a a uh, data section. Yes. If it's print, if it's preprinted and printed. Is it printable or not? Okay, so that's a valid one. What if it's a data section? This is a section of writable memory. And this is a section of writable memory. I changed this one, I haven't changed this one. If I haven't changed it, do I have to write it back to the disk? No, because it's exactly the same as it was. If I change this one, do I have to write it back to the disk? Yes. Yes. So which one's less expensive? The one where you haven't changed it. The one where you haven't changed it. Yes. The bottom. Yeah. So what you could do is you could have a, uh, a bit on there saying, has this been changed or not? If it's been changed, then, and there's another one who hasn't been changed, then always choose the one that hasn't been changed, right? So some of the data structures you can put on there is, has it been used recently? Has it been referenced? Has it been modified? Is it protected memory or not? Is it actually in memory or not? Okay, that was sort of that X that we showed earlier. If it's an X, it's not in memory. If it's a 7, 8, 9, 10, then it's in page 7, 8, 9, or 10. So there's lots of different things in that page table, not just that one value of, oh, it's up here. Okay, so we've got this page table. Now, if you think about it, if we've got a 32 bit address, okay? So we've got 32 bits here. Um, part of it is going to be that offset, and part of it's going to be the lookup table, right? So let's say each chunk of memory is um, 8K. How many bits do we need for 8K? Hmm? No. How many bits do we need for K? The K is 1024? 16. Or 2 to the 10th. 2 to the 10th? So K needs 10. So 8K. Eight. Okay. Ones, two, three, four, two. Okay. So we've got ones, two, three, four, five, 
ones, twos, fours, eights. So we're going to need three bits. This is two to the third, two to the second, two to the first. For eight things, we need three bits. For k, we need 10. So for 8k, 3 plus 10, we need 13. That leaves how many bits for the offset? 19. Okay. Uh, so with 19, let's say 20, how many are we talking about? 10 bits is a K. So 20 bits is a meg, or almost a million, right? So we've got almost a million entries in the page table. Let's go think about a huge chunk of memory, right? And if I have to look, it's like, oh, hey, I found address 1111. Well, I've got to look in that whole page table to find where is 1111. I've got a table a million long. It's going to take a long time to search for that whole table every single time we need an address, right? So can we make this a slow process, or do we make, need to make this a really, really fast process? <coughs> Fast, right? <coughs> so, for mapping to virtual addresses, from virtual addresses to physical addresses, we have to make it fast. Um, and what's one way of um, making things fast? I gotta go look this up, and then I'm gonna look this up, and then I'm gonna look this up, and. Okay. Who said caching? Oh man, you're gonna make me throw this way over there. <laughs> Excellent job. Okay, caching. What if we had a, a cache of, hey, these are the 10 pages in memory. I only have to look at 10 places. I don't have to look at a million, right? So basically what they did is they said, hey, we're gonna go ahead and have what's called a translation, translation look aside buffer. Uh, look aside buffer. So the things that we've hit recently, we put in this cache. And we don't have to look at all the million places. We've got 10 different processes. We only have to look at 10 places. And again, in that translation look aside uh, buffer, you're going to have, um, you know, what is the virtual page? Where is it actually? Is it modified? And maybe some things like, hey, you know, is it being written to? Uh, are you allowed to read from it? Are you not allowed to read from it? Um, one of the things we talked about was isolation and protection, right? So wouldn't it be nice if you could actually split your program up into, here's the program and here's the data section. If we have that ability and we know this is a program section and this is a data section, do you want them to ever be able to write to the data section? Do you want your process to be able to write to your data section? Absolutely. Do you ever want your process to write to your instruction section? No, you never want to overwrite your instructions, right? Unless you're like, like um, Most programs don't modify themselves. So it would be nice to add a little bit of protection to say, hey, I've got a bit in here to say, this one is a read-only, you know, this is my code, this one's read-write, this is my data. All right, I'm going to skip that one. Okay. So one of the things is, so let's talk about which page are we going to swap out next. Now, theoretically, if I knew, hey, I've run this process, or maybe we're even to the point where, uh, let's say, we're going to split our code up into different parts. This is my instruction section. This is my data section. This is my heap. That's my stack. So if I'm going to swap something out, theoretically, what would be the best one to swap out? Possibly. Preferably something who doesn't have beads. If I've got an instruction here, and I'm in instruction 100, and I've got another chunk of code that has instruction 101, and another code that has instruction 1,000. Which one do I want to swap out? 
Okay. Who else to say that one? Okay. Um, so you really want the one that you're not going to use for the longest amount of time, right? Because if I'm going to use it next, that's not the one I want to swap out. Or if I'm going to use it in three time cycles, that's not the one I want to swap out. What I really want is the one that I'm not going to use for a thousand seconds. Okay? Now, do you know deterministically when, what piece of code I'm not going to get to for a thousand seconds? And you know what code is going to be up, uh, executed you know, given any amount of data that's coming in, um, any data value that's coming in, you know which piece of code you're going to execute or not. No. So this optimal one isn't possible. Okay? Very unrealistic. There's no way to know what you won't ever use or won't use for the longest amount of time. But the optimal solution is what we use as a benchmark. If we could do this, this would be the best. And then we're going to look at five or six other algorithms. We're going to end up comparing them to the optimal one to see which one's closest. Okay. So if we have four chunks of memory, okay, um, what is one way to say, okay, we have A, B, C, and D, which one are we going to choose? Okay, so for example, not recently used. If I've got A, B, C, and D, and I'm currently in B, I've used C recently, I've used D recently, but I haven't touched A in like a thousand milliseconds. Which one am I going to swap out? Well, so at least recently used, A. Uh, in order to implement that, then you basically have to go ahead and have uh, an R and an M bit. R is referenced, and M is when you're written to. So you end up with four different classes. So class zero is, I haven't looked at it, and I haven't changed it. Or I haven't looked at it uh, recently, but I have changed it. One is I've looked at it recently, but I haven't changed it. And three is I've looked at it recently, and I have changed it. Okay. So those classes, zero, one, two, three, somebody who hasn't gotten these, which one are you going to swap out first? Class zero, one, two, or three? Zero, because you haven't looked at it recently, and you haven't modified it. Does that make sense? So now all you have to do is you have to just look through the list of things, of processes, and say, do I have any class zeros? Boom, you're out of here. Nope, okay, do I have any class ones? Boom, you're out of here. If I don't have any class zeros or ones, then I'm gonna start looking at class twos or class twos. Uh, Okay, another way, first in, first out. So assuming we have this um, address of uh, spatial locality, okay? So if I you know, run 100, then what instruction am I probably gonna do next? 101, and then 102, and then 103. And so if you run 100, and you go onto the next page, and you're you know, at 200, and then you go to the next page, and you go to 300, if I'm down here in the 300s, then maybe I should get rid of the 100s. So I'm probably not going back there, right? So by using first in, first out, if I pull in this function section first, and then this one, and then this one, and I need a new one, get rid of the first one, okay? Super easy to implement. All you have to have is a queue, okay? And so you just go ahead and throw it up in the queue, into the next one in the queue, to the next one in the queue, and into memory. So I take the first one, chunk it out, move everything up. I need some more, I take the next one, chunk it. So that's great if you go from like 100 to 200 to 300 to 400, and you always go straight from lowest to highest. What is the programming construct that's going to mess that up? It's not an if. It's not a case. What's going to cause us not to go from 100 to 200 to 300 to 400? What's going to cause us back, huh? Loop. Loop. You said that? 
You already got the one? No. Okay. Let's see if I can make it. Yay! All right. So Luke, you go from 100 to 200 to 100 to 200 to 100 to 200 to 100 to 200, to 100 to 200 right? Well, if I do that and I get in A, I get in B, I throw away A, and guess what? I just went back up. Now I need A again. So I pull in A, and I'm going to throw away B. Now, golly gee, now I need B again. So you can start thrashing, right? So first in, first out works great for sequential code. It's horrible for loops. So what's a, what could we do to fix that? If we had our queue, you know, first one, second one, third one, fourth one, we always take the first one and throw it away. What could we possibly do to that queue so that if we had a loop, it wouldn't mess us up? What if we didn't immediately throw it away, but if we put it back in the queue again? And so if we want, you know, A, B, C, D, and an A, B, C, D, and we have that loop. So we put an A, we put an B, we put an C, now we need some room. So we take A, and we actually throw it in the back. We move everything up. Well, then we need A, oh, it's already there, so let's get rid of B. And then put it in there. We get rid of C, we put it in there. We get to D, we don't need that one, so we're going to throw it away, and we still have A, B, and C in memory. So this is what's called a second chance loop. So we have our ABCDEH, we actually put A back in the loop, into the queue, right? Now, you can't do that indefinitely because then you never throw anything out, right? So basically what you do is you have an extra bit in there. Say, is this the first time? If so, put it back in the end of the loop. But if you've gone all the way through the, the queue and get to the top the second time, then we're going to go ahead and trash you. So that basically allows you to take care of loops. Okay. Um, it's okay, but it, uh, it's not perfect. There's another version of that called clock paging, which basically, you know, we've got all our things in there, and we just have this pointer that says A, and then it goes to B, and then it goes to C, and then it goes to D. And basically what happens is you've got that little bit, you know, this is my first chance or my second chance. And um, if you are uh, at the first chance, then great, we're gonna keep you in there, but we're gonna decrement your R to zero. If you go back around again and you're a zero, then we're gonna go ahead and chunk you out. So again, it's just a circular buffer and with that um, R bit, and so you're only going to go ahead and throw it out if it's zero. Yes? So if you get a loop that's executing like more than once, mm -hmm. would that bit, like it's the bit, would, would you have to indicate that it needs to be put back into the queue multiple times? Yeah. Remember, R is recently used. So if you're recently used, then you reset the bit. If you haven't been recently used, then it's going to go to zero. And if you come up and go, ah, now we're going to throw you out. So basically, you can get re refreshed and refreshed and refreshed and refreshed. It's only when you haven't been refreshed in a while and you've used up your second chance that you get thrown. Okay, so you kind of just assume that everything's in a loop and then things that aren't in a loop will get pulled out. Right. Okay, um, another one. Um, we have FIFO, first in, first out. The other one is least recently used. So if we've got a bit here, and or not even a bit, we actually have more information saying, hey, when was this last used? Okay. Um, and then you can go through the list and say, hey, uh, we've used this one five seconds ago, this one was three seconds ago, this one was 10 seconds ago, this one was 100 seconds ago. Which one should we throw out? Probably the 100, right? It's not first in, first out, because that just says, hey, we came in. This is when we last used. So it's the oldest unused thing. And again, you can put bits in there. It's very similar to, uh, hey, you're at time zero. So since it's a one, you're gonna set it to zero. 
so that goes to the zero. Time two is a one, so you set it to zero. Um, time three, one, you end up chunking it out, and fall. Again, all just ways of saying which one do we throw away next? It's all basically around this concept of a working set. As I'm running my program, I may have a huge program with lots of code in it, and you know, here's my lines, you know, zero through 100, and here's my lines, you know, uh, 200 through 300, and here's my 400 through 500. Well, let's say here's my loop, and I'm doing stuff, and I'm keep going and doing and doing and doing and doing. And occasionally, I'll call a procedure. My procedure is down here. But this is my exception handle. How often am I going to go through the loop? Pretty often. We don't want to throw this one out. Occasionally, I call my procedure. We don't want to throw this one out. But this is my exception handle. Hopefully, I'm not going to go into my exception handle, right? You know, you're only going to do that when really bad data comes in or somebody programmed something poorly. So that would be a good candidate to throw out, right? So the whole idea is if you knew, well, I want to keep this one in memory, and if I have to, I'll throw this one out, but always give this one precedence, okay? So if you knew this block, this block, and this block are the ones that really need to be in memory, okay? That's my working set. Those are the ones I have to have in memory. All right. Well, if you knew what the working set was, and let's say here's all our memory, here's our OS, and we have A, B, and F are my working set. So you know, this one needs 10K, this one needs 10K, this one needs 10K. Um, now, I may have 100K of program, but these are the only ones I'm currently running, right? Everything else is procedures I don't need right now because of the data. You know, I don't need to do that. I don't need to do that. I don't need to do the exception handling. I'll never get to that piece, those pieces of code with this data. As long as I have these three in memory, I'm good. I can run and run and run and run and I don't have to pay for them. Now, let's say that needs 30K to run up this 100K program. I have to have 30K in memory at once. What if I only have 20K of physical memory? What's going to happen? Well, I'm going to pull in A, I'm going to pull in B, and all of a sudden I need F. So I'm going to have to throw one of these away. And so I'll pull in F, and it'll work, and oh, now I'm going to pull in B. And then I'm going to have to pull in F. We're going to get into a thrashing situation. So anytime the actual amount of memory available is less than the amount of the working set, then you're going to have problems, right? If the amount of memory three is bigger than the working set, you're not going to, you're not you're never going to have a problem. You pull in the first one, you pull in the second one, you pull in the third one, and then you run and run and run and run and run. You won't have any paging, right? And if you have excessive paging, what's the definition for that? Pull this one in, throw that one away, and then you have to throw that one back in and throw this one away, back and forth, back and forth. What's that called? <coughs> Thrashing. Who said that? Ah, you got to be. <laughs> All right. Um, so that's one of the things you don't want is you don't want thrashing because of locality of reference. You can all, uh, you can eventually come into a steady state where the whole working set is in memory, assuming you have enough memory. <sighs> All right. So one of the things you can do is you can say, all right, what if we have our R bits, and our R bit is the, has it been referenced recently, and we have our M bit, which is, has, it, has the memory been changed? Well, then what you can do is you can say, every so often, you know, every interrupt cycle, um, I'm going to go ahead and look. If R is 1, okay, so I've referenced it recently, right? Then I'm going to set the current time. 
in the, the data structure. So it's been recently used, right? If it's zero, so I haven't used it recently, okay? But the last time I looked at it was only, you know, five, 10, 12, you know, whatever the amount is. It's less than our critical T. Then I'm gonna go ahead and keep it, okay? But if it hasn't been used, and it's beyond that critical T, maybe our critical T is 100 microseconds. So if I'm at 10, eh, I'll still keep it. If it's at 110, that thing's out of here, okay? Then what we end up with is a data set like this, where it's basically got, hey, for this page table entry, this was the last time it was used, and it's been referenced recently. Or this hasn't been referenced recently, and it was last used at time 1213. This one hasn't been used, but it was last week, uh, used at uh, 1620. So potentially you go ahead and say, hey, we're gonna get rid of the 1213, and uh, that that's really uh, 1620. So basically, if, uh, no page is larger than T, and we gotta choose one of them, then at least go to the one um, that is clean, one that hasn't been modified. And again, they've got a version of this where you've got the clock thing, so you can go ahead and just make have a circle or buffer, have a pointer to it, choose the same um, R and M bits to decide which ones to do. All right. How much time do we have left? Okay, we still have 20 minutes, awesome. All right, um, so again, clocking, you just go ahead and check if it's one, change it to zero. Um, if it's zero, check the time. If it's less than time, don't worry about it. If it's pretty old, then go ahead and uh, chunk it. If you have to, uh, always chunk a clean one uh, better than a dirty one, because it takes more time to make it. All right, so now we've got an idea of, hey, we've got this virtual memory. We've divided it into pages, chunks of memory pages. Some pages we swap in and out as needed. We've got some sort of procedure or algorithm for deciding which ones to pull in and out, right? Great. Now that we have that, let's go back to our segmentation idea. Because remember, originally, we either had fixed blocks, everything's 8K, or we had completely dynamic segmentation. So this is 1K, and this is 8K, and this is 3K, and this is 20K. Or we maybe even had the buddy system where we you know, divided it by binary tree. So now we're going to revisit that whole segmentation idea now that we have paging. Okay? So what you can go ahead and do is you can say, okay, a process is going to be divided into unequal segments. So maybe I have a 1K for the data, and a 5K for the memory, and then maybe a bigger chunk down here for the heat and the stack. So, now we can go ahead and place each of those segments in memory as needed. Um, but, we're not gonna do as a big huge 10K chunks, we're gonna do it as a 1K and a 3K and a 5K. Each of those different pieces and parts each have their own little dynamic section. Um, of course, we can still do fragmentation, but because each little piece is smaller, you're not likely to get to a situation where, oh, I need 20K, and I've only got a 5K, a 5K, a 5K, and a 5K free, because you're not asking for a full 20K block. You've actually split it into the data section, the page section, the stack section. Each one of those sections is smaller, so you're more likely to be able to fit in what's left so you can actually use space a little bit more efficiently. All right, so we're gonna say we're gonna have our program and we're gonna split it up into, hey, the symbol table's down here, the, te the source is here, the constants are here, the stack's here. Now, each one of those things, instead of requiring the whole 20K, can be split into, oh, I only need um, you know, this much here, 12K here, 16K here, 12K here. Those can now fit in the little bitty spots um, that are left over. Okay, 
Um, again, we still need a way to translate. Um, so basically we have to add that offset. Um, so for each section, we have that base and offset. And uh, so we're gonna have to go ahead and do the segmentation tape. So just like we did paging, where we said, okay, the first six bits tell us where to go into the page table, and we replace those six bits with these six bits. Take those, put them here, now you have the physical address. We do the same thing with segmentation. We can go ahead and say, hey, we're gonna take this first little bit here. Now, we have to go ahead and say, okay, well, for 0001, we look at the 0001 entry and say, here's the base. The problem is, earlier we had you know, a base and we knew the, the bottom part of it because they were all 8K. So all we had to have is a base. Well, with dynamic, you have to have the base and the length, okay? So we're starting up here and we're going for 1K. Or we're starting down here and we're going for 8K. So the only difference is now, you have to have a little bit more informa informa uh, information in your data structure so that you can go ahead and implement this. You need the base and the length. So, let's go ahead and compare and contrast. If you have um, linear address spaces, if you have paging, okay, then there's only one address space, right? It's zero to the max. And this virtual address, go ahead and pull off the first few bits. This is, oh, you're up here or you're down here. In segmentation, each one of those can have its own quote unquote linear space. Um, and I guess I should have popped this back here. So with paging, um, can you do virtual memory? Yes. Yes, you said yes. All right, take another one. Um, if you have segmentation, can you do paging? Do you have a B? Do you have a B yet? Yeah. Okay. Yes or no? If you have segmentation, can you still do uh, virtual virtualization? Can you have more memory than um, is actually on the physical machine? Yes. Okay, thank you. Ah, horrible. Um, okay, so can you split up your procedures and your data? With paging? No, there's no way to split. You have a whole program in there, all 20K going at once. With segmentation, you can split them. So you can say, oh, my procedures go up here, my data goes down here. And my procedures shouldn't be changed. My data can be changed. Um, so what if things fluctuate? On a page table, you know, if you're just saying, hey, it gets eight chunks, or eight K chunks, and here's an eight K chunk, and here's an eight K chunk. If this eight K chunk has my heap, and my heap uh, dynamically grows and shrinks, can I dynamically grow and shrink that page size? No, page size is fixed. Can I dynamically grow and shrink um, a segmentation? Okay. Did you have to be yet? Can you dynamically grow and shrink a, 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 a segmentation? Uh, no. Okay, remember, it's got a base and a length. Mm -hmm. So do you think that we can, in that data structure, change the length, the dynamic length? Oh, yeah, you could. On page table, you can't. It's always going to be 8K. But a segmentation, you go ahead and change that length. You've got that part of the data structure. You have that flexibility. OK. Um, is it possible to share procedures if you have paging? 
out because this chunk's allocated to this process and this chunk's allocated to that process. You can't say this process is allowed to read that process, part of that process is memory. Now, if you have segmentation and you say, hey, my shared code, my shared DLL is right here. Could I allow multiple processes to look at that shared process? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and again, so why did we do paging? To allow large linear uh, spaces. So we can have you know, a gig with a virtual memory, even though we only have one meg of actual memory. Segmentation allows us to break programs up into independent little parts. You know, here's my data, here's my post, uh, procedures, here's my um, stack, etc. Allowing the stack to grow and shrink, allowing things to be shared, etc. So this would be a good one to go ahead and look, look at. All right. Yes. So I guess I'm having a hard time understanding it. If segmentation is always dynamic and it only needs a couple of bits to have the difference between paging and segmentation, do we always use segmentation or is there a purpose for both? It's not just a couple of bits because we have to have the base, the base address, and we have to have the length. Okay? So it's not just a couple of bits. And we've got our R bit and our M bit. And it takes a lot of work to go, oh, um, this base address and this length. So somebody comes in and says, hey, I want to alloc 128K. Well, now I have to go look at my list of well, what's available. And this one, I have to use my least recently used or whatever. I have to find a space that's big enough. I've got to go ahead and create one with this base address because it fits here with this length because you asked for 128K. I'm going to set it to R to 1. I'm going to set change to not. There's a lot of work to do segmentation. Paging is easy. Where's the next thing in the page table? It's got an X. That's where I'm sticking you. All I have to say is your page table is 6. Okay, so it's a lot more cost heavy to do yeah, segmentation. Absolutely. You get a lot more flexibility, but at the expense of bigger data structures, a lot more processing. Yes? Do our operating systems like use both? Or what would we use? It depends. And what happens is we're slowly stepping from, OK, the easy case is just this. But that doesn't work well. And now it's a little bit more difficult but, and now we're even more difficult, we're about six steps away from where we really have a true operating system. Okay. okay. So, give me about another two weeks. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Actually, let's stop here. I was supposed to be. We could have a review on Thursday and a text.